temple, right? She she's slept there for the rest of her life. Guarded the temple and oh. shit. And I asked this guy, he was a guide. It turned out to be this lady's neighbor. And I was an older man. He was like a Sufi, like a mystic. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, you know, am I allowed to stay in the temple overnight? And I had really no intention of doing it. And then he said, the last person I took was an American woman. And he said he took her in there. All he took was a water bottle each. And she wanted, she was dead again. He knew that she wasn't the right kind of person. He could feel her vibes mm. and read her. But, you know, he said, I said, okay, took her in there. And she was sort of talking gibberish, a bit scared or whatever. And then there's like a hole in the top of the temple and it's desert out there. Like it's in the middle of fucking nowhere in Egypt. Right. And a desert fox put its head over the temple and it's the temple of Horus or whatever like that. Right? Uh-huh. And so the moonlight shot and it was like the reverse bat signal of a fucking wolf. Yeah. And she's like, Anubis, Anubis, Anubis. And he reckoned she started rocking back, frothing, and foaming at the mouth, eyes rolled back in her head. And she was like getting fucking crazy. So he's splashing water and trying to get her back. And she like, he reckons she cracked. Never was mm. the same. She like lost her mind thinking Anubis was like sending signals into this fucking hieroglyph bullshit tomb. Right. Yeah. Crazy. It, and, and, and then anyway, so I'm like, yeah, I'm still keen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we stayed in this thing and like, man, I shit myself. Like every little fucking gust of wind, I'm like, that was like, you know, the howl of Indiana Jones, you know. Fall. I am, man. I, I would love to go. I've read lots of stuff from, you know, Alistair Crowley. Oh, yeah. And he, he loved going it. Egypt and some of the stories. Did he? Yeah, because he. Yeah. So what's the story of that guy? Well, he he was basically like a British, you know, mystic, if you were like an occult yeah. person. He was really interested in you know t- tarot and you know, but yeah, really into Egyptian mythology. And he went. I think the story is. I'm kind of might be telling it wrong here, but he goes to Egypt with his wife at the time, and then I think she starts communicating with. Like Horace or Horace, I think. Oh. And he gets really jealous. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, how dare you? You know, I take you here to Egypt with me and then you get to communicate with Horace. Yeah. But, you know, he did some weird stuff. I think he would, he so would that, draw portals and put his, like, assistant in there and, like, he would step out of the pentagram just, like, yeah. allowing the gods to, like, you know. Yeah, all I know about it is the Black Sabbath song and then Jimmy Page used to live in his house, bought yeah. his house or something, his manor. Yeah, he was really into him. Even the Beatles, he's in the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Club, Hearts Club album. Oh, like really? He, yeah, like he's in the top left like corner or uh-huh. something. He inspired a lot of, you know, kind of, I guess you would say maybe he was like an early Satanist. Yeah. You know, he was, he was interested in the occult and like different, mythologies and stuff. I mean, but, that's ballsy back then because, you know, yeah. that's like they'll burn you at the stake kind of shit. That, that's right. Well, that's, he, he was very interested in the Kabbalah and stuff as well, which is like, you know, cosmology and stuff. And so he called himself the Beast 666. Hmm. That was like his sacred number. But people labeled him as like the, the wickedest man on the world, right? Yeah. So then the word, <laughs> the number 666 became synonymous with the devil, devil the beast. The beast yeah. But he just called himself the beast because it was like a, you know, like it was a strength thing for him. Yeah. Like it came from kind of whack ideas that he had. But yeah. these all got construed into over time into kind of this image of this like 666 devil worshipping kind of guy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And who do you compare him to in modern? Is there one of a version of Alistair Crowley alive and kicking today? Can you think of a famous one? Oh. Mm. Uh, Marilyn Manson, maybe for a little bit. Oh yeah, what? It, who's, that, who's that British comedian, Russell Brand? Oh, do you reckon? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, you know, it's about. I, th- I don't think you know people are overtly religious anymore. You know, in, in yeah. the kind of mainstream. Yeah. You know, it kind of it icks people well, a little well, bit. Unless you you're know. American, probably not. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and even then, it's like kind of you know people have lots of different beliefs. It's kind of, but we have this idea of like a spiritual war kind of going on, you know, yeah. like Good wellness war. You know, these are uh. things that are kind of based on new kind of, I don't know. This Do you mean new. like the war of people's judgments on yeah. re- what's happening in the world? Yeah. yeah. Like a I judgy think, war. Well, yeah, a judgy war. Like uh, we're all, you know, you like, uh, are you a liberal or are you a, you know, are you a, yeah, it's like to the left or the right, or you or this yeah. or that, or you 
are you non-binary? Are you or what, whatever it is? It's like we're putting people into these little. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I've kind of. Come on. No, what's what I think? What I, and that you can feel that war because for me in my head I call it the eggshell war mm. because you like you used to you used, used to say things and people disagree and they say what they think and it was kind of an exchange, but now you need to preempt what's going to offend them and it's like everything you say in conversation mm. is like you're trading on eggshells. Yes, and if you and it's almost like you need to know what everyone else will be offended by before you right. speak, and then it ends up making speaking your mind nearly impossible. Yeah, it takes away the like the freedom, the playfulness of life. Do you yeah. know what I mean? If you're afraid of the end product of what people are going to think of you, then yeah. it's going to, you know, stop you from saying things. And that yeah. that sucks. And and like you, and so much it erases your legacy. Like mm. there's, I mean, obviously there's people that fucking do horrible things, like, mm. but did great work. Like Bill Cosby, for example, like did great work on the Cosby show. It was fucking really bad in real life. Mm. And he's kind of been wiped from the annals of history, you know, or Barry Cable, Aussie rules football. I'm not that big of a football mm. guy, but like he's a Hall of Famer, legend, did some shit in the 70s, bad shit. And then he's getting his whole legacy erased. Like, do we cancel, I, yeah. you know, I don't know that. ignore the art? Like Michael Jackson, weirdo, but Tom yeah. Cruise, I mean, weirdo. I still, yeah, listen to you know, love thriller Michael when Jackson. it goes on. Like, <laughs> like I love Michael Jackson. But like, you know what I mean? Like their art, but and I, do we cancel them? Like, But I wouldn't have let him look after my son, for example. <laughs> that always, got, I remember thinking I was, I've got to stand up comedy about this, a bit about this. Mm. And I'm like, I thought that shit was crazy. And what, like Macaulay Culkin is in Disney Adventures <laughs> with a monkey doing sleepovers at Michael Jackson's house. And I'm like eight years old and I thought that was fucking crazy. Yeah. And so I can't believe that, I don't know how the world but, let that happen. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, apparently Macaulay, Macaulay says that he didn't do anything. But that isn't that Chappelle's joke. It's well, like, if you were going to do anything. <laughs> What's his joke? If you were going to do any kid, it would be, be Macaulay, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, if he didn't get done, then he doesn't think he did it. <laughs> Uh, Chappelle is a fucking mm. master. Ah, oh, so good. But yeah, that's funny. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, um, kind of, yeah. It, it, going back to yeah, I think you know, I, I think with art or with any anything that you kind of start, you have to have a playful attitude and a, and a, not a fear of will I make a mistake or yeah. will I go wrong or will people judge me for this? You know. Yep. And, and half I, the half the time when you start something, you don't know where it's going to end up. Mm. And uh, you've got a rough idea, so you give it a go. But, oh, man, it can take any, like, you got to overcome technical issues. you got to overcome, you know. Mm. We talked on this podcast to Mark Huxley. He's an independent filmmaker. And uh, you guys should talk, actually. He's cool. Mm. But he, he just, like, if he runs into a problem, he just literally, like, burrows around it and comes up the other side with a creative solution. Because that's what creativity is. is almost trying mm. to get through thinking, like, that's you right. know. Yeah. I mean, kind of, if everything does go your way, you kind of, feel like you've missed out on that opportunity to be creative the to adventure. solve a problem you know yeah um, yeah it's it's crazy business because it's so you know you spend a lot of money making films mm -hmm. and let's you know most people could buy a house for or, or easy could buy a house for it and a small micro budget film is worth yeah and it's an investment and then you got to make people into it you and you kind of don't know what the outcome is mm. that's the crazy thing well you know i I feel like I've done a lot of things for the for the artistic product, not really the for the money. Yeah, um, <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. You um, know, I didn't get it just for the money. Yeah, I mean, mm, I don't know if we want to go there, but like you know, I have these amazing memories, and with the thing I love about film is they're not just memories; they they are something that I can go back to and yeah. watch and show other people, you know. And it's creative output is cumulative because mm. once you've done it, it exists and it's there. And yep. then if you just keep doing it, you have this body of work that's quite phenomenal after like, well, we've only been at it 10 years mm. and, you know, there's all this stuff you've done and seen and like, it's just accelerating. Projects are getting bigger and better and funding is becoming available and it's like, man, it's going to take off like crazy. Yeah. 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 There's going to be better, more stuff, I think, you know. Yeah. It's going to get better. You make better decisions, better projects, you know, things you want to do. Yeah. You know, and I've never really been picky 
with stuff that I want to do. I think it's okay to do some things that are, that's a bit crap. Like, <laughs> you know, I was in this film. It's called Toxic Obsession. Oh, yeah. Have you seen it? Oh, yeah. I've seen the trailer. You've seen the trailer? It's, enough. It's, a, it's on YouTube. Bro. I know exactly because I've been on about six of those films. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I rewatched it. I play a very short, small role in it as like a bartender or something. So it's me, my, me, me, and my girlfriend. We we rewatched it recently. Yeah, and we had the best time ever. Fuck laughing yeah. the whole time. Yeah, you know, like it is what it is. It, it is what it is. It does what it's supposed to do. Yeah, this guy made this film on basically on his own. Penny like, eh? No, yeah, he was the director. Yeah, yeah. But uh, what's his name? Jag. Jag Panu. Jag Panu. Is he a dentist or something? <laughs> I think he's a dentist. He's he, a mythical figure in Perth. Amazing. He's basically like Perth's Tommy Wiseau. Uh, yeah. The room? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I mean, that's how we got, that's how we got our first film funded too, is dentist money. Yeah. But the condition is that he has to be in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you got no choice what you're going to do. But it is not well, like man. James James Pentecost did an amazing job of this movie. It yeah. is very funny, and he put in all these little Easter eggs in it just, that just make it hilarious. Yeah. But the the beauty is, how did he make this this film that's kind of taken the piss <laughs> without <laughs> letting the guy who funded it know that they're taking the piss? I don't know if they're taking the piss. That's the bit, right? But like, I think that's the real. That's what they're aiming for. Yeah, but I mean, he obviously that. understood the brief, right? The brief was make <laughs> make me a make star. the script work, right? Oh, make the script work, yeah. It's like, yeah. Well, his, but, his twenty grand make me a star. That's what I thought I, the brief there's said. Something about, oh, there's something about there's something about his like complete lack of self awareness that that makes it work in such a, in a weird way. Do you know do what know, I mean? Do you know what's crazy in our film? It wasn't the, we only took five grand from him, right? To make, yeah. uh, Mark Huxley took five grand from him to make Wrong Night Stand. Yeah. And we're all like eating, you know, we have one Domino's pizza to share between each other for the night because it's so little money for a feature film. Oh, no. And then Jag rocks up on set with a fucking Lamborghini or something. Yeah, what do you yeah, have a Ferrari yeah, or Lamborghini? He's got a Lamborghini. And he rocks up on set and we're just like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and we're like, would you like half of Domino's pizza? Yeah. But, you know, what a good business model. But I think that all, that funding existed because there was a loophole in giving to the arts for tax reasons. Mm -hmm. And so he realized he could give people 30 grand or something a year and get a film funded and be a film producer and be in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and save money on tax, you know. Well, we it closed the loophole. That, that funding stopped and no one's got it since. We went to the premiere of his film and... You know, they did a big Q and A, and he's out the front, and he's yeah. like, "It went perfect." It's, it's the bit. <laughs> it went perfect. Everyone did their job perfect. It's the it's the, the it's the movie business. Yeah. They've is it invented a scene in Perth where there was no scene, like because yeah. I mean, yeah, like I said, I worked on probably three of those. I worked on I can't remember the name now. It was like a car escape one with Chloe Brown, and I don't remember. But anyway, like you know, shot work with Scott Summers shot that. The whole film as a camera operator, like, you know, I understand the, the lack of food on set mm. and stuff, you know, but there, without those dudes making crazy stuff, there's no, there was no work. Yeah. You know, there's no work in this town for filmmakers, really. There's about, you know, four films getting made here a year. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I went to TAFE to do a film for a year. Oh, and, yeah. And set four? Yeah. A lot uh, of cool people did that course. They did. And for me... I was like, I don't think I even passed the course, but <laughs> I met so many filmmakers there. I was straight out of, I was straight out of high school and I went, and that's the first time I met people like Johnny Ma. You in Johnny Ma? No, he was, he was a year about like, but that's when I met. That them. was the super year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there was. Lauren Brunswick. That's um, right. DVS. Yep. Johnny Sullivan. Um, like the editor. Is it yeah. Aaron McCann? Aaron McCann. Yeah. That um, was all one year. Yeah, man. And so I was the I was the year below and I met these guys and saw them, right? Yeah. And then I went on to do Whopper acting course. And then I met them again because they were through, you know, the film industry in Perth. Like John, Johnny Ma got his studios and How know. much fun have we had at Johnny Ma's studios? Mm. Oh man, like some of the best nights of my life. I've just been mm. hanging out there. 
Yeah. That guy is as creative as a human being comes. I think like, man, he needs to be treasured in. 